हरे नमः There are unexpected influences which enter the astral body of an individual seeking the absolute truth. Influences which could result in such a transcendentalist coming to Krishna consciousness. Whatever path or cult one chooses will be produced by different influences. When selected, all of these will entail an attitude, an atmosphere of a distinct attitude, one which is different, different from that of the mundane. Those competing cult attitudes will be infused with exclusivity, meaning that they're saying, we're the only way. Obviously, we focus here in our presentations upon the influences and attitudes contacted by transcendentalists who approach and or enter bona fide or bogus manifestations of bhakti yoga. Everyone's path of approach to the absolute is individual and thus different, at least to some extent. Nevertheless, there are some common threads for personal transcendentalists since they have a different attitude from the impersonalists. The impersonalists and the voidists dominate the scene both in the West and in India at this time. The difference in attitude, which includes a difference in confidence, that difference is often quite stark and sometimes it produces painful realizations. You can get overlorded by a cult figure absorbed in self-apotheosis and his accompanying confidence. He exudes that confidence. That confidence is always infused with contempt for those who do not, who do not look up to him like that like he wants to be looked up to and who do not share it with him. Getting caught in such a cult means to be in a pathetic position underneath a bright starry sky that is ultimately nothing more than a dreadful roof. It may appear to be an Eastern cult. Superficially, it could be so. But artificial, contemptuous cult attitudes and their accompanying confidences are mostly Western. The current Western civilization, philosophically, socially, economically, and especially politically, is anti-Vedic and thus automatically anti-Vaishnav. Yet somewhat indirectly, the cult's divergent makeup gives a seeker, the one who fortunately survives the ordeal, it gives him a clue as to something being very wrong within the cult. Beneath the thin veneer of Western civilization, a painful and fearful realization lurks everywhere. And the realization is this, those you contact or have to deal with have the same bestial and reptilian mentalities and emotions as are found where subhuman entities populate the uninhabitable forests and swamps of this lonely outpost we call Earth. Now there is a Sanskrit word called ashram. Most of you have heard of it. It means shelter. There is also the well-known term Guru. Guru means heavy with knowledge and realization. A genuine guru forms an ashram, generally, wherein those who come to him for protection receive it in his ashram. His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada attempted to create an international house in which all genuine seekers of the Absolute Truth could take shelter, live happily, and make progress on the path to perfection. 
This attainment of perfection is called Siddhartha. We have spoken about it previously. In order to transcend the cycle of birth and death, which in Sanskrit is known as samsara, it is imperative that you transcend whatever vestiges of animal and reptilian life are still present in your astral body. You cannot do that within a cult where its leaders are still loaded with those proclivities. A genuine bhakti cult helps you, but not a sahaja cult. It does not help you. All genuine transcendentalists know this, but when someone initially becomes a seeker of the Absolute, he or she sometimes does not know it. However, the realization comes soon when accepting the yoga path, and it can be quite scary. Nuclear jitters are one thing, and we are in another period where they are re-emerging, but the existential jitters of realizing how the so-called man or woman you are dealing with is internally little more than a two-legged animal or reptile, that's another thing. It is a constant social factor, and that alone makes it fearful. When it is also the actual situation within a bogus manifestation of bhakti yoga, let me tell you, it's far worse. You come to the shelter of a guru in order to escape existential fear, and that freedom is provided, or it's supposed to be provided. It was provided for all newcomers to Prabhupada's branch of Lord Chaitanya's Hare Krishna movement in the latter half of the 60s and most of the 70s. However, a lot has gone down since then. It's a scary realization when you actually see and the Sanskrit word for this is vijnana, when you actually see that you are dealing with so-called devotees whose intoxicated minds are absorbed in delusion, envy, violence, hatred, overlording, aggrandizement, fury, and greed. When you realize a two-legged animal with tilak on the forehead and kunti beads on the neck, perhaps carrying a dunda for what he is, and if you used to consider him a comrade or a reputable leader of a spiritual institution, there's going to be a kind of deep shock you're going to have to experience. That shock produces a cult variety of existential jitters because... That's where you're living, and that is where now everything is in your life. There's no shelter. But Prabhupada was supposed to have brought us that oasis. Are you picking up on what I am putting down here? It was that oasis for a while. You come to what appears today to be a Hare Krishna oasis or shelter from the burning fire of what's underneath the thin veneer of Western civilization. You do so only to find out, even during the period of economy, that you have entered but another version, a much worse version of the same thing. An elder god brother, once a somewhat close friend, has called the initial weeks or months that a devotee enters Krishna consciousness to be the stage of economy. Although I never heard Prabhupada use that terminology, it nevertheless makes sense. There is an exhilaration during the early weeks of the process. Although the austerity is very tough, benedictions of various sorts come quickly and easily. It's an exhilaration that could never have been experienced before because the topmost level of the transcendence is not to be found anywhere below it. In most cases, there's another factor. The devotee who finally reaches Krishna conscious faith, in Sanskrit this is known as Komala Shraddha, he's often previously gone through an excruciating period of research into other philosophies, sacred texts, in almost all cases, so-called sacred texts, cults, 
and even religions, particularly of the Abrahamic variety, there is much relief to be had when a sincere and serious seeker of the absolute truth gets above and beyond all of that. There is so much relief when he or she comes to the plane of perfect teaching, perfect process, and perfect understanding of how everything fits without contradiction. This is initially achieved when you reach the first rung of Krishna conscious faith, philosophy, and process. Now, our presentations always center on transcendence. As such, we delve little into astral detours, such as quote-unquote spiritualism, which is not rightly named. The many and various materialistic and empiric philosophies and groups, we don't give them much consideration. When a sincere and serious thinker rejects all forms of materialism, he or she begins search for the absolute truth. In the due course of that search, there will be philosophical connections and decisions will have to be made. They'll have to be made constantly based upon unavoidable confrontations. For example, is the absolute truth ultimately cosmic, void, impersonal, or religiously theistic? If it's cosmic, the argument could and should be made that transcendence would then be an illusion. During the era of the hippie high life, there was much talk about quote-unquote cosmic consciousness. It was considered by many of them to be the ultimate realization and contact with it was believed to be made via hallucinogens. Yet, there are preliminary questions to consider. Does the advanced state of cosmic consciousness even exist? The answer to that is it certainly does. Can a human attain to this state of realization? The answer to that is that it's possible, but rare. Is cosmic consciousness, which obviously implies a kind of universalism as the ultimate paradigm of the absolute truth, is cosmic consciousness the topmost realization? Is it a form of pantheism? Or is universalism much higher than pantheism? Can either of them be considered theistic. On the basis that most Western seekers do not even come into contact with henotheism, most of them don't even know about it, the next encounter by the seeker of the absolute will be with voidism, generally, exemplified by Jain or Buddhist teachings. Since Jainism is more or less restricted to one area of India on this planet, we shall simply consider Buddhism. It is in some form available everywhere, and it's also quite popular amongst the intelligentsia, New Agers, and many celebrities of the Western world. The Buddhists consider the goal of its teachings to be the absolute truth. There's a transcendental element to it, obviously. Sometimes, make that most of the time, the goal is said to be nirvana. Actually, in classic Buddhism, such is not the case, is complete cessation of all desire the ultimate goal of realizing the absolute truth. For those who believe it to be so, they gravitate to some line of Buddhism and some Rinpoche or Lama. To wit, tear down the house of pain, and as a result, cease desire, cease to exist, and realize the absolute by becoming nothing. In Sanskrit, this philosophy is known as Shunyavad. Yet in Vedic texts, there is not only mention of Nirvana, there is also mention of Brahma Nirvana. This refers to the impersonal Brahman. In the hippie era, it was often called, quote-unquote, the white light. It is superior to cosmic consciousness, but this differentiation was not known by very many hippies, most of whom were too casual and anti-scientific when it came to researching the absolute truth. The Upanishads emphasize attaining to the white light of Brahman. They are classic Vedic texts, but only one of them stresses what is above and beyond Brahman. 
the idea advocated by the gurus from India, but not by the Buddhist gurus, of course, was to realize yourself as a spiritual spark, as eternal Brahman, and then merge into Brahman. In other words, and this was directly preached by virtually all of those Indian gurus with one stark exception. Impersonal Brahman is God. Realize it, merge into it, and become God yourself by such merging into the oneness beyond all differentiation, beyond all desire, and beyond all intelligent comprehension. Up to this point, we've not mentioned theism. Is theism transcendental? The Abrahamic religions would certainly not implicate any of their religions with this term. They're after heaven, which they falsely claim is eternal. They also claim that for hell, which is also false. Heaven is very gratifying, and life there is much longer than it is here. However, although heaven is part of the higher sector of the material universe, it is lower than cosmic consciousness. In short, the theism of the Abrahamic religions, and we can include deism to some extent in this, is not at all the theism of the Vedic conception. That theism, that special theism, is known as Vaishnavism, and it is entirely transcendental. Most of the listeners and readers of this presentation know it as Krishna consciousness, and rightly so. When the seeker runs the gamut of all of the preliminary trials and tribulations and successfully passes through the confrontations intrinsic to those trials and tribulations, he or she comes to Krishna consciousness. Again, what stages any individual has to pass through in order to come to Krishna consciousness will be shaped by that individual's svabhava, interests, and the environment and time in which he or she lives. For example, none of the hippies, a significant slice of whom came to Krishna consciousness in the mid-60s through the early 70s, none of them had to pass through considerations of the Abrahamic religions. This is because they paid these so-called religions no attention there was nothing in Orthodox, Catholic, or Protestant dogma to have to deal with or pass through because those stumbling blocks had already been rejected, root and branch, by virtually all hippies, if not every single one of them. There's an irony in this, and it will be discussed subsequently. What you have heard and or read thus far can be considered a kind of mini-introduction. If you're into the topics introduced in this presentation, it is presumed that most of you are devotees of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, at least devotees of some sort. Those other philosophies, cults, dogmas, and teachings hold little or no value for you, and rightfully so. They should not be valued, as they are all ultimately useless because they're all chock full of mistaken knowledge. For the handful of you who are seekers of the absolute truth, and this is basically your first contact with Vaishnavism, then your host speaker has both very good and very bad news for you. Paradoxically, both forms of news are integrally interrelated. Be patient you should be able to assimilate this fact as your hearing and or reading proceeds. By now, if you are sincere and serious, you have heard strong evidence. Make that conclusive evidence that realization of the absolute truth is not at all easy. Actually, it's even harder than you think. That is part of the bad news, by the way. Why this fact is particularly so at this time will be explained to you in some detail. The good news, in part, is that if you are now just coming into contact with Vaishnavism for the first time, it is possible, if not likely, you can immediately quantum leap over becoming entangled in the bad news. It's doable. 
and more importantly, it must be done. As an analogy, consider the board game played by young boys back in the day. You roll the dice and hit a square that is connected to a ladder. This immediately moves you up 10 or more squares. If you hit a square with a shoot, you go down. The board game was called Shoots and Ladders. Only if you are an age similar to mine is it likely that you played this simple game which was solely based upon luck. For you complete newcomers who are listening or reading this presentation, coming into contact with it is a ladder. When His Divine Grace Sri the Prabhupada arrived on American shores in the mid-60s, he inaugurated a branch of the Hare Krishna movement. That aforementioned stage of economy was part of the benediction that his initial followers received by serving him in subordination. Subordination is intrinsic to Krishna consciousness. When you come to Krishna consciousness, the material world and all of its countless factions work against you with very rare exceptions. Such was the case for the devotees who came to Prabhupada's branch of the Chaitanya tree in the 60s and early 70s, your host speaker included. Such is not the case at this time, however. You do have some things going for you now. They were not going for us back in the day. And these things going for you will be discussed subsequently. You have benefits we did not have at that time. The internet is one big example of that, and you're taking advantage of it right now. However, you have three big things going against you that we did not have to deal with directly until mostly after Prabhupada departed physical manifestation. These three major impediments are known as one, the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, two, Neomut, and three, Rithvik. These are, individually, major stumbling blocks on the path of the difficult process of knowing and realizing the absolute truth. These cults all have different attitudes when you enter into their spheres. They are all supremely confident and contemptuous. However, they can be overcome, and you must transcend them. You must do so in order to reach the final goal of Krishna consciousness. Henceforward in this presentation, we shall primarily consider the fabricated so-called ISKCON confederation. It's the mothership, the big kahuna of the three groups, and it is ultimately the most dangerous of the lot. Without good and honest association, and the knowledge that only genuine devotees can give to you, along with essential service opportunities provided to you by them, it is very difficult to get to the other side of the chasm that these three fake manifestations create. Tatvamasi. The wheelhouse of their scams consists of effective blocking power, which is impeding and covering. It pulls you away from the absolute truth. Not only are they conspiring to do this to you in various ways, they are already fully engaged in it. In order to understand so-called ISKCON better, let us consider the following verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 15, Text 12. Itharmaha paratharmascha apasa upama chalaha atharma shakaha panchema tharma gyo tharmavat tyajit. Quote Irreligion, religion for which one is unfit, the semblance of religion, analogical religion, and cheating religion are the five branches of a dharma. One who knows real religious principles must give them up." Unquote. Dharma means religion, but this must be understood in the proper context. Dharma is your ultimate, true, and eternal nature. 
Any system of spiritual life with a genuine Guru Parampara, one which allows you to realize who you actually are, is to be considered dharmic. The term quote-unquote religion is not to be overemphasized. Real devotees do not consider that Prabhupada's movement should be referred to primarily as a religion. Instead, it is really a culture and a philosophical system authorized by the cream of the Vedic literatures. It is based upon Guru, Shastra, and Sadhu. It is not based upon religious protocols. When the term religion is used, it all too often conjures up images of organized religions in the Western countries of the world. This is never wanted because that is not the Hare Krishna movement. What is applicable to the Hare Krishna movement is just the opposite. In other words, although your host speaker is now using the term religion in the description and explanation of that Bhagavatam verse, consider that I'm actually referring to the Vaishnava line of Guru Parampara, which predominantly means its process, culture, and perfect philosophy. When an organized Vaishnava entity, or what appears to be a Vaishnava organized manifestation, acts according to its concepts and goals, if it is not bona fide, then it falls into the category of Vitharma, Paratharma, Apasatharma, Upamatharma, or Chalatharma. It may have symptoms and manifestations that include more than one of these deviant elements, but it will essentially be but one of them. Let us consider so-called ISKCON. Is it irreligious? Not according to any loose or corporate standards accepted in the West. It has the ephemeral and overt requirements to be considered a theistic group. It worships a supreme being. As such, so-called ISKCON cannot, superficially speaking, of course, be considered irreligious or atheistic. Is so-called ISKCON a religion for which its participants are unfit? Interestingly enough, some of the scholastic and intellectual critics of so-called ISKCON or the Hare Krishna movement consider it to be so. They say that Westerners should not engage in these kinds of austerities and this kind of manner of dress, rituals, mantras, or its particular lifestyle. They claim that Westerners are unfit for this kind of Eastern worship. Obviously, all Hare Krishna devotees reject this, but we can see where those critics are coming from by some recent results. This is an in-depth topic, actually. Prabhupada, in an authorized way, modified, do not recompromise here, he modified the process to enough of an extent that most sincere and serious Westerners could take to what he demanded of them from it. For the purposes of this presentation, we should conclude that so-called ISKCON is not so severe in its regimen as to wipe out those who participate in it on the basis that they are unfit to accept its austerities and rituals. Is so-called ISKCON an apasatharma? Most certainly it is. From every angle of consideration, it is an apasatharma. From the angle of it being a semblance of what it was originally and what it was meant to be, it is certainly a semblance from the angle of it being a lax and half-hearted representation of a genuine Krishna cult, it also fully qualifies. From the angle that it is an imitation of a bona fide bhakti manifestation, again, that shoe fits, and so-called ISKCON is wearing it. Is so-called ISKCON an analogical religion? We must conclude that it's not. It has no such features. It does not employ analogies or myths in order to spread its influence. It certainly is not into scientific ways of expressing its latter or message or what it means to be an, air quotes, ISKCON devotee. Hmm, now the final question. Is so-called ISKCON a cheating religion? Many of you will opine that it more fully qualifies in this category rather than as an a semblance. Ultimately, 
that it engages in cheating, and this is well known by now, does not mean that it is primarily a chalatharma. Ritvik is where you get an egregious example of a cheating religion. The original formation of so-called ISKCON, from which it is warped, in other words, the so-called ISKCON of the 1978 First Transformation, that is one thing. But the original formation of Prabhupada's movement, which he gave the title ISKCON, and which was completely bona fide, that's another. So-called ISKCON is itself a splinter group from its original foundation. And Prabhupada's movement was 100% free from cheating during its manifestation while he was still physically manifest. Your host speaker would argue that Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement back in the day was the only organized Vaishnava entity in the Western world that was not cheating those who came to it before it deviated in the late 70s, of course. Certainly, so-called ISKCON has cheating arrangements within it, but because of what it split off from, and because the teachings spread by the original entity are still to some significant extent available from it, so-called ISKCON cannot be pegged to be primarily a Chalatharma because it's an Apasa Dharma. Although it is rather irreligious in that it now contradicts the regulative principles of real Dharma, it is not to be categorized, categorized as a Vithharma. Although it is also a hypocritical manifestation, it is not to be categorized into the Paratharma category. Although it opposes the Guru Parampara, and although it misinterprets Prabhupada's intentions for carrying out what he wanted and ordered for his mission from it, it is mostly a semblance of the real thing. So another question comes up now. Why does so-called ISKCON still have the power to spread if it's only a semblance? What is the means by which it convinces people that it's the best way or the only way to achieve the spiritual world. For those who are unable to recognize the superficiality of its veneer of civilized behavior, which means those who do not know its actual history and how it took over, what is it about so-called ISKCON that still attracts? What is it about so-called ISKCON that still convinces there are many reasons, obviously, and all of them cannot be accurately listed and explained in this presentation. As such, if we boil down to the essence of these obviously interrelated questions, what is the intrinsic quality? Is it a quality that is unique to so-called ISKCON? Actually, it's not that unique. For the answer to this important question, let us remember that nifty short book which Prabhupada produced in the mid-70s. The Sanskrit title is Upadesha Amrita. Its author was the great Chaitanya disciple and guru in our branch of this line, namely Rupa Goswami. The English translation of that title is The Nectar of Instruction. We're going to focus upon the third verse of Nectar of Instruction, which is Utsahan Nishchayad Thariyat Tat Tat Karma Pravartanat Sangatyagat Sato Vritahe Shadvir Bhaktihi Prasidyati. Quote Enthusiasm, confidence, patience, straightforward dealings, renunciation of bad association, and following the footsteps of the Acharyas are the six principles for achieving complete success in Bhakti Yoga." Unquote. Now, which perverted reflection of these qualities becomes paramount in the deviated institution? When there is such a semblance of a genuine Bhakti cult, 
then many of its original and bona fide principles must also still be reflected in that facsimile. And such is certainly the case with so-called ISKCON. Satan is ignorance. And there is a great deal of it in so-called ISKCON. Indeed, Satan calls the shots there, but this is hardly recognized. We can probably find a potent clue which addresses the question accessed from this verse of the Upadesha Amrita. Actually, we've already given you that clue. Confidence and attitude are inextricably linked. No sane person denies this. Confidence is essential in any successful endeavor. In terms of the perfection of Hokti Yoga, that is reiterated in this verse from the Nectar of Instruction. Yet confidence is to be found in all cults. It is also generally found in the competing nation states of the world, including much of each of the citizenry comprising each nation. The various Buddhist lines are loaded with confidence. Ditto for the Mayavadis. None of them lead to the perfection of yoga, the perfection of this rare human opportunity. Of course, we are including so-called Iskan, Neomat, and Ritvik in this syndrome of overconfidence. Once you peel off the layers and get close to the onion's core, once you put almost all of the pieces of the puzzle together, you come to Krishna. When you do so, you will certainly be confronted with the fierce astral struggle between and among so-called Iskan, Neomat, and Ritvik. Actually, considering Ritvik in particular, it has its own internecine conflicts within its own overall heresy. If you enter into that wheelhouse, you will find this out sooner or later. Probably sooner. As just mentioned, you will, from direct experience, if you enter any of these three splinter groups, you'll find the leaders in them loaded with confidence. It is unfounded overconfidence within the milieu of a cult attitude, one which is as obnoxious as it is dangerous. Those aggressive leaders exude extreme confidence. Sometimes it is of the oppressive manipulative variety. When it's that, those saffron dissemblers especially demand an attitude from you. If they pick up that you're not exuding it, they may ruthlessly snap you for failing to shove all your chips full in. Now, what's the basis of their confidence? It has been mentioned repeatedly thus far. It is the all-pervading attitude of the groupthink with individual agents of the Borg all of whom are involtuated by the cult of Gregor on the astral plane, wielding highly contagious energy in order to crack those who have not yet fully bought in. Every cult forces its followers through deception, guilt, and doubt to develop a need to be reassured that they are accepted by its leaders. Uh, but there's a price to pay for that acceptance. You get nothing but spiritual degradation from it, but that obviously is not what's advertised. Instead, all the unfortunates have been promised an automatic ticket to the spiritual world as long as they stay on the boat. How do they prove that they are loyal? The way that they prove that is they adopt the same all-pervading attitude exuded by the cult leaders of choice. Better than that, they adopt a proselytizing confidence to bring in new fools who, like themselves, then get suckered and overwhelmed by false confidence. It is false, but people with a poor fund of knowledge cannot see that. They can't realize it. Instead, they simply pick up on the powerful emotion which cracks them and their ability to resist what only appears to be a group of blessed devotees. Oh, but it gets better. There's another price that has to be paid. A new false flag has to be worshipped when replacing its exact opposite. This goes down through the emergence of a major transformation forced by damage control. We all have practical experience of this in the mid-80s. 
The zonal scam was cratering due to major scandals, many of them of the sexual variety. The pompous glorification of Sahajas posing as Mahabharats was exacting a toll, and doubt was creeping in everywhere. Satan saw that it was time for a change, and change there was. The second transformation of the Collegiate Compromise was ushered in primarily by Professor Blueblood in his powerful position papers. Remember, during the Zonal Era, if you did not believe in the complete divinity of Ocean's Eleven, you were considered a demon or influenced by pathological forces. You could and would be ostracized for that if you spoke up about it. You would certainly be criticized and held in low esteem at bare minimum. In August of 1978, Prabhupada's most effective personal secretary was living in downtown Vrindavan, Loy Bazaar. He heard about all of the glorification that these new 11 gurus were receiving throughout the world, but they weren't receiving it at the center of the Krishna Bharam Center in Raman Reddy, but he heard about it elsewhere. As a result, in distress, he wrote a long, thoughtful letter to one of his godbrothers, and that one happened to be one of the 11, making cogent arguments that all of that worship should cease, that none of it is what Prabhupada authorized. He was simply dismissed as being out of touch. Informed in a reply by a snail mail, there's no internet then, that the worship and glorification program was being received by everyone in the West with great enthusiasm and joy. It wasn't, but that was the attitude being projected by the Eleven and, the, and their loyal sycophants. The Eleven Great Pretenders were overconfident that they could cavalierly dismiss this warning from an elder godbrother who happened to be the best scholar in the movement and had been assigned to finish translating the Bhagavatam after Prabhupada departed physical manifestation. Uh, that service was taken away from him, but that's another story. Now, at almost the same time, the temple president of Bombay wrote a position paper of protest although his had more bite to it than Perduma's letter. One of the eleven came down very hard on him, although Bombay Prez was a leading devotee in the movement, particularly in India. Anksaduda told him to stop criticizing Prabhupada's pure devotees. Anksaduda accused him of trying to kill the movement. Anksaduda demanded that Bombay Prez stop issuing his position papers Stop causing havoc and disruption. He claimed that Bombay Prez was envious that Prabhupada, as one pure heartbeat, had allegedly empowered 11 pure heartbeats as his replacements, all of whom were more dear to Prabhupada and more advanced in spiritual life than Bombay Critic. All such massive overconfidence crumbled in the mid-80s. It was replaced by another transformation, which did not clean house, but only made superficial improvement. The Krishna consciousness movement is not meant for projecting improved superficiality into the general mix while corruption still lurks within it. There were some devotees, your host speaker was one of them, of course, who did not buy into the second transformation. In the second transformation, the current got switched from DC to AC, and you had to accept. The vitiated GBC approved the new dispensation. If you did not accept, then you were, like before, compared to an axe trying to chop down the tree of so-called Iskand. All the fools did not want their initiations to be challenged, but the initiation was still intact when the initiating gurus were busted down to madhyams, although there were no such thing. They were sahajas, light years inferior to the status of a madhyam. Yet, a new overconfidence emerged in the Borg, and everybody had to accept it. A new flag replaced the previous one. 
it flew completely in the face of what had been accepted and promulgated before, but that elephant in the room was entirely ignored. There was a new cult in town. A new attitude was implemented. You cannot make progress in bhakti without confidence, and the new confidence of the new collegiate compromise was a transformation that every devotee, upon pain of ostracism, was obliged to make. This is how bogus bhakti cults operate. Realize it for your own benefit, for your own protection, and for your only chance to make real transcendental progress. The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. Since Prabhupada departed, it has undergone three major transformations, all of them radically different from the one they replaced. The first transformation upchucked his actual movement, and a brand spanking new confidence was demanded. After that, it was one unauthorized concoction replacing the previous facsimile. According to time and space, if you were part of any of these, you were engulfed on the astral plane of the new groupthink attitude. The attitude you were ruthlessly forced to accept in the previous iteration was now condemned. Warlocks with dundas were the chief enforcers both times, along with their hatchet men. How can you have confidence in such an organization like so-called ISKCON? How can you have any confidence in these kinds of unpredictable, unreliable, and farcical reversals? Those are rhetorical questions, of course. Sadeva Samya.